All right, so I want to I want to make sure you guys uh, get this because the next two slides will mean nothing to you unless we'll probably need something to you anyway. But uh, it'll mean extra nothing to you if uh, you don't understand what real and nominal actually are. So again, uh, I will put the definitions because um, that's not going to help. But you have to know what they mean because you have to understand what inflation actually is and how it works. Um, so for uh, real and nominal data, the best way to understand it is again. The, the value of the dollar, what can you buy it for? So here, here's the example um, uh, I gave uh, you just now, actually, uh, from Germany 1920s. All right, so uh, their money's called marks. I'm just gonna say dollars so it makes more sense to you. If I said I made a million dollars this year, you'd be like, wow, that's a lot of money, right? That's the nominal data. You made a million dollars. That's a lot of money, right? Okay. It is right now. But if I went back to Germany in the 1920s, uh, when they had an episode, um, they made some, some errors economically, and they had a, a phenomenon called hyperinflation, which is where the value of their currency went way down. And what that meant was, with each dollar they had, or they were called marks, they could buy less. So here's the example. If I told you you made a million dollars, you'd be like, wow, that's a lot of money. Nominally, it looks like a lot, because that's just what the number means. But if I told you that I made a million dollars except where I'm living, in this case in Germany, 1920s, a loaf of bread costs $100,000. Do I make a lot of money by making a million? No, I can barely buy anything, right? Uh, if I make a million dollars in a year and uh, a loaf of bread's $100,000, I can only buy 10 loaves of bread for the whole year, right? So then gas might be something like uh, uh, $50,000 a gallon or something like that, uh, something certainly low. So when we talk about real data, I mean how much, not how much can I spend, but how much can I buy, if that makes sense. Nominal can fool you by having a huge number, but it doesn't mean a whole lot, the number's big, if everything's super expensive, all right? So real data is what can I buy with my money, all right? So as inflation goes up, as these numbers get bigger, the actual value of my dollar goes down because I can buy less with it. All right, uh, I'll give you another example. Um, when I used to play video games um, as a kid, like, you know, like the arcade ones, uh, almost all of them just took one quarter max. I haven't seen an arcade machine for like 10 years. That only takes one quarter. Now they take 50 cents or a dollar. All right, so that's another example. It's the exact same thing, play the video game, whatever it is, but it costs, at least nominally, four times as much. Uh, to, to, I put in four quarters instead of one quarter. All right, so yeah, it's like, oh, I have a dollar. But like, yeah, a dollar when I was a kid was more than a dollar is right now, as far as what I can get for it. All right, so real doubt is, how much can I buy with the, uh, with the money? All right, so what happens over time is a thing called inflation. These numbers always get bigger, but it doesn't always mean I can buy uh, more stuff. It usually does, but not always. Uh, when that happens, this is called uh, inflation. And there's several ways this happens. And we'll talk about uh, a lot of them this week. Um, I'll just give you all of them initially. Cost of production goes up. This can be because of uh, paying for labor. It could be paying for taxes. It could be paying for, that's a good couple. Oh, other regulations, we'll get way into that in a second. Or I could have an increase in money supply, uh, which just means we have more money. It's the example I gave you uh, with the in and out. If you have $10 for a month, you're probably not gonna go run in and out. If you've got $1,000 for the month, you probably will, or you're at least more likely to. So people have more money, they spend more, that causes prices to raise. So these all cause prices to go up. The question is, if those prices go up, do you also make more money? All right, if you're not making more money and all the prices go up, you're actually uh, losing money, all right? So let's go over a few examples of how this can occur. First one is uh, after World War II in the 1950s and 60s and 70s, there's a bunch of things that are really, really gonna raise the cost of the cost of production. And the first one we'll start with here real quickly is labor, because I can go over this one pretty uh, pretty fast. Uh, back in the Depression days in the 30s and into the 40s, 
they made laborers way stronger. Like they made it illegal to uh, for uh, a company to stop them. They uh, allowed them to exist in the first place. They allowed them to exist across entire industries. And what that means is, if I'm a <coughs> factory worker, no, not a factory worker. Let's say I'm a teacher. Teacher. It used to be for unions that if a school was doing bad, like uh, let's say we're trying to get a raise and the district's saying no, uh, we could have all teachers across the state or county or country uh, go on strike, which would force all of those schools, but certainly mine, uh, to increase the wages. So they used to be able to do that. Uh, that uh, uh, that uh, Taft-Hartley Act that you guys uh, had in the jigsaw, that made it uh, Im impossible to do. So it used to be uh, teachers or workers or whoever uh, across an entire industry uh, could unionize and act together. So that would force anybody who wants to replace you with subs or, 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 or what you call scabs uh, for replacing the workers, almost impossible because everybody was on strike for the most part. And they thought that that was too powerful. Also, they could uh, pretty much, uh, I don't want to say bribe, but yeah, we'll say bribe. They could bribe and lobby to pol politicians uh, in the 30s and 40s. So what we had was labor unions were really strong. <laughs> and uh, workers would go on strike. The companies would have to increase pay, pay for more health uh, privileges, things like that. Uh, and what that does, and it's good for the workers, don't get me wrong, having health insurance and unemployment, all that, that's wonderful. But the only problem is, if I make my employer pay me more, what does that employer have to do with all of the stuff that they make, as far as the prices go? They, they gotta raise them, right? Uh, so, while this does help workers out uh, with certain features, it is also going to raise the cost of production, which causes the price to go up. So that's one element. This is going to go down after that uh, uh, Taft-Hartley Act because it gets rid of this. They can no longer uh, bribe politicians. They can no longer work across the entire industry for Taft-Hartley. So in the 1950s and onward, uh, labor unions are going to get weaker. In fact, now their uh, uh, membership is really, really far down. But they did make a major impact for a 20, 30 year stretch and made it much more expensive for companies to make stuff. Which of course, as you guys know, if it's more expensive for me to make it, I have to charge you more. All right, so that's gonna raise prices across time. So labor, that's one. Taxes, ooh, here's a good one for you. From last week, I think. What's it called? What kind of policy is it when the government uh, adjusts its taxes uh, and it affects how I spend my money, meaning it makes stuff more expensive or it gives me more money if it's a rebate or I have less money if there's more taxes. There's a policy. It starts with an F. An F. It does start with an F. <sighs> what? Oh, no, nope, not quite. Fiscal, fiscal policy, oh. yes. This is fiscal policy. Fiscal policy. Uh, basically, that's just the government spending money, like charging taxes uh, uh, to spend uh, more money for the most part. All right, and that does affect us, by the way. If the government charges way more in taxes and I have less money to spend, I'm gonna spend less money. All right, if the government uh, uh, reduces taxes and gives me more money back, then I'm going to, of course, spend more. So fiscal policy can actually affect uh, what people uh, are making um, as far as how much money they have. Okay, so in the 50s and 60s and 70s, there were some on the jigsaw, by the way, the, the government had to raise taxes a lot in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Why did they have to raise taxes so much in the 1950s and 60s and 70s? There's a bunch of reasons you could actually give. Oh, I didn't give you money, by the way, for getting that first one, by the way. What's one reason they had to increase spending? The government did? Now I'm talking about why is the government raising taxes? Okay, they do increase spending, but I wonder what they're spending on, like specific things that they might have to pay for in the 50s and 60s and 70s they didn't have to pay for previously. There's one example from the jigsaw that fits this. I'll give you a triple Morgan buck, but if you get it. They were spending more on welfare. Like, what do you mean spending more on welfare? They 
we're putting money into welfare programs, but so think back to Yep. Uh, great Society is a great example of that. All right. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying the programs are all terrible. We need to get rid of them. What I'm telling you is if I have the government pay for uh, medical expenses for, for elderly people uh, and I uh, have Social Security, which is government funded, pay for uh, people on disability, uh, if I increase the amount of food stamps available, increase the amount of welfare pay available, Who's covering the, the, the uh, tab on that, the bill? Who's paying for all of those things? What? Everyone is. How are we all paying for it? With taxes, right. Okay, so again, don't, don't, don't think that I'm like lambasting these programs so we should get rid of all of them. We do need a safety net, right? Older people do have a harder time with these things. Uh, you can have bad things happen to you when you're disabled, and it, it would suck if you're just like, well, now you just get to die. Um, so when you should have what's called a social safety net for one bad crap actually does happen to you, you don't, you're not just automatically a lifeless blob that gets to die slowly, right? Uh, having a, a safety net to help you with that from the state is a good thing, but, and you can argue about which programs actually work and what don't, we're not gonna do that here. Regardless, if it's a good program or a bad program, it costs money, correct? Right, all that costs money, so the government has to take it from the uh, citizens, and that's gonna, of course, raise taxes. All right, so for better or for worse, those individual programs, they cost money, uh, so you have to raise taxes. All right, how does raising taxes make prices go up? What? I said it adds to the the price. How? Uh, it takes like a percentage of the price and adds it. It does, to yeah. So if you're talking sales tax, like here in California, if I go buy stuff, like it costs like 8% just to buy it here. Right, so that's gonna raise the price itself. Also, if I'm taxing the company, it's gonna cost them more to make it. So they have to raise the price uh, to make up for that, yes. So again, these programs, again, you can argue about which ones are successful, which ones aren't. Uh, they still do cost uh, quite a bit of money. Okay, so great society costs a lot of money and any social spending, so that's rule, 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 rule social spending. So government money spent on uh, us in the welfare state. Okay, what else? What else does the government spend a lot of money on? That's a big one. It's still not the biggest one, but it's still a big one. Um, banking jobs. How so? Is it like public works projects? Okay, yeah. There's way less of those, but yeah, that's still part of it. I, I, that's worth putting in there. Public works. Highways, okay, dams, bridges, etc. Got uh, social spending on like uh, welfare, social security, things like that. Public works, building roads, things like that that the government uh, pays for. What else? There's another huge bill that the government's got to pay. Military spending. military spending, right. So that's a big one. That's one we need as well. You can't not have a military. And people can argue we spend too much or not enough on it, whatever. The point is, it does cost money, and we have to pay for it through taxes. Does anybody know why? I'll give you an additional uh, bonus to this. Why is the United States spending extra, extra money in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, and into the 80s? more so than they normally do. Except for World War II, of course, because that was a direct world war. Wasn't it because we were in war with Vietnam or something? I'm we were in this. Vietnam, but like, you're right. I'm gonna give you that. There was a big Vietnam war going on, but like, well, that's, a, that's a small part of this large scheme where the US spends billions of dollars across the world on multiple little wars or funding other wars. They have been gotten more. That's free trade. I'm talking about what are we spending money on? Uh, Vietnam War is a part of this bigger thing that has a lot of other conflicts in it. They do. What was that like Cold era War. called? There we go. Cold War. Uh, you had a lot of um, uh, wars that were being paid for. Either were involved in directly, like in Vietnam, or were funding other governments to try to stop the spread of communism. Right. So Vietnam War is an example of that. All right. That's very expensive. Um, there's one more. You guys have not quite mentioned regulations. Oh, you know what? Actually, no. We were talking about taxes. So you guys got those. Well done. But there's one more uh, I want to mention. So labor, unions have made it, it more expensive to have workers, for better or for worse, in, in, in whatever category. Taxes uh, are raised because of public funding for uh, social programs, like great society programs, public works, military spending, the Cold War. That all costs a bunch of money. Uh, so that's going to make taxes higher and cost production higher and prices higher. What do I mean by regulations? What regulations? Health regulations. Health regulations? 
That's true. That's older, but yes. That goes back to uh, that goes back to like the 1910s and 20s and 30s with the muckrakers and all that. So you're right. I will I will include that. So if we're looking at regulations, it makes it more expensive uh, for a company to have to pay to uh, make their workplace safer and sanitary and all of that. So safer workplace requirements. And these are the regulations that. Yeah, these are these are things that the government forces, um, for better or for worse, forces businesses to do. So you definitely nailed one. It's a little earlier in time we were talking about, it, but it still it still counts, right? Because you got to uh, uh, pay for all these safety measures and, and all of that. Um, like regulations for like employee protection? That, that's part of that, um, but, you, but you're not um, wrong. Well, there's one more that just starts in the 70s. Environment. Environmental regulations. Okay, cool, we got that. Yeah. Right, that was part of the uh, Environmental Protection Agency, started by Nixon in 1970. Um, now again, just like the social spending, don't think I'm like ripping on, or military spending. I'm not saying this is a bad thing. But I am saying it does cost money. So when you force a company um, uh, to dispose of its waste differently, because obviously it can't just go dump all its toxic crap in the river, uh, because then the people and animals and plants that are dependent on that all get sick or die, and, and, it, and it ruins the environment. Even if you don't like the environment, you're not like a, a, you think that people that do are tree huggers or whatever, uh, you still got to live here. And if you make it unlivable for you, then you, get to, you die as well. So we do have to regulate the environment to some extent Right? We can't just trash all of our water and all of our land and not be able to live on it and then all of a sudden all die. Um, so in the 1970s, the government starts regulating that. They start requiring people to uh, dispose of things properly. And it's more expensive for me to pay to transport my garbage to a dump or to some other facility that can properly uh, dispose of it non-toxically than it is to just dump it in the river or the ocean, which is what they did for like 50 years. Um, so, when you require companies to uh, get rid of certain substances that are toxic or radioactive uh, and find a more expensive alternative, that increases their cost of production. If you force them to recycle or dispose of their waste properly, that costs money to transport and have it done. Uh, needs to be done, still costs money though. So that's going to raise uh, prices as well. So it's not even one of these things. I'm not saying we shouldn't spend money on the military, we shouldn't spend money on social programming the environment. No. You could argue about how much we need to do, but uh, we need to do all of those things. The only problem is, from an economic perspective, that's going to make it much more expensive uh, to uh, make things and buy things here in the United States. So that happens across a few decades, and what you have is inflation. You constantly have prices going up to pay for the extra taxes. Okay. And uh, that's pretty much it for this slide. I'll have to finish up this number page tomorrow. So during the Cold War, this is where we get kind of a bad rap. During the Cold War, we were so set on stopping communism that uh, we would stop anybody that was anti-communist. So usually it was us defending a fellow democracy, but sometimes we uh, supported uh, nasty dictators uh, just because they were anti-communist. A couple examples, Idi Amin in Uganda, was a bad guy who ended up becoming socialist anyway. Uh, but we support him just because he's anti-communist and he was a uh, humanitarian disaster. Pinochet, military coup, uh, uh, imprisoned and killed several thousand people. But we support him just because he was uh, in Chile, uh, just because he was anti-communist. So yeah, we got some marks on our record for sure. Um, but that's what I meant by sometimes we support a dictator, sometimes we support democracies in the Cold War. Uh, it was anyone who was anti-communist. All right. Um, so we left off on the monetary policy. I'm going to hold off that for one second because I want to talk about price controls, which I forgot to mention yesterday. So here's another thing that from the Great Depression uh, up until just after World War II, after, I, think, I want to say 1947 was the last one that we had, or they took it away in 47, whatever it was. But uh, price controls are, ah, they can be effective, but they're usually uh, more negative. So. Well, first of all, does anybody know what I mean by price controls? Price ceilings, price lowers. Yeah. Uh, what do you mean by that, though? You're right. Price ceilings, price. price can be, how low it can be. And who's telling me how high a price can be or, or low it can be? The government, right? So this is when the government government imposes a uh, uh, price floor, a minimum price. 
that could be wages or, or goods, uh, or a price ceiling, which is the maximum you can, you can uh, charge. Is that, uh, is that free market? That the government's telling uh, the uh, 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 suppliers what they can and can't do? No, that would not be. Um, and I'm not saying that uh, you know, nothing can ever be good with regulation, because we know you've got to prevent monopolies and cronyism and uh, protect workers to some degree, uh, and environmental regulations, because the market doesn't do that. Uh, but these don't always work out as planned. So you guys actually know some examples here. And the reason why I'm talking about these is, well, first of all, we have to for the uh, uh, test and standards, but uh, these do contribute to some pretty nasty situations in history, uh, and they do cause some inflation here in the U.S. So uh, price floor, one example you guys probably know about is minimum wage. Politicians are always talking about wanting to raise this or lower this. Uh, some of us think, oh, yeah, of course you want to raise it. Um, how terrible are you of a person? Why would you want to lower it? Uh, there's reasons why people would not want to raise it or lower or maybe even lower it. Uh, and a good example of price ceiling would be uh, rent control. When the price of rent in certain areas gets astronomically high, like for example, um, if you are, because we're here in the valley, if you want to rent a house, three bedroom house-ish, maybe four bedroom house, it's gonna run you close to $2,000 a month, maybe a little higher, depending on where you're at. Uh, anybody know what it costs to rent a single room studio apartment in San Francisco right now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's, it's like, it's, I want to say, I thought the average was closer to 4000 but uh, I could be a little off on that. Nonetheless, it's like twice as much as it is here for a whole house in multiple rooms uh, to have one single studio room in San Francisco. And by the way, our example here for $2,000 for a, a regular house is really high compared to elsewhere in the United States. So rent control is where the, the state steps in and says that's too much for people in the area. Uh, you have to uh, uh, reduce it or, 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 or cap it at a certain rate. So this sounds good. Um, and sometimes it can be effective. We'll, we'll talk about how after I'm done explaining why it usually turns out badly. Um, but these actually cause a lot more problems than you would think. Because again, you would think, oh, if people can't afford something, uh, we'll just force everybody to lower the cost of it. Like if gas is too expensive, the government can say, nope, uh, it's gotta be uh, $2 a gallon instead of $4 a gallon or, or whatever. Uh, and in, in your head, you're like, yeah, that's great, because now we can buy it and, uh, and it helps everybody else and, and screw the companies because they're just trying to make a bunch of money. They are trying to make a bunch of money, but um, the reasons why they raise prices aren't always just because they want to gouge you. Uh, sometimes it actually has to do with uh, market issues and cost of production. So here's what happens when uh, price floors and price ceilings are actually used, and I'll kind of tell you how it contributed to the mess that is the 70s uh, economy. So uh, minimum wage, we'll start with that one. So let's uh, look at a standard uh, supply and demand graph. So here's the price. In this case, it's going to be wage price. Um, we'll have to be a little bit different. It'll still be quantity. Uh, we're talking about wages, so this isn't buying or selling anything. So the supply and demand curve can represent different things, but it still functions the same way. So what this is going to do is minimum wage causes a, um, a surplus. Am I saying this right? Yes, it causes a surplus. So this is our demand graph, this is our supply graph. The supply is actually going to be um, uh, jobs, basically. No, sorry, uh, available workers. All right, you with me on that? Some of you shook your head, good enough. Uh, the demand is going to be uh, jobs, basically. <laughs> These are the, the, uh, the companies that have jobs available. Right? Uh, demand, company, I'll hope I rephrase this. Companies wanting workers. Right, the amount of jobs available and the amount of workers available. All right, so let's, what's the minimum wage now? It's like 15 or 12 or 13? 13. 13, there you go. Let's just say, let's just say that's market equilibrium. So that's 13, this would be 14, this would be 15. This would be 12, 11, 10. It would go down further, but we're just going to start there. All right. So let's pretend there's no minimum wage, and it's just the average wage for everyone in this area is $13. Okay, so we can pretend that. So what's probably happening if it's market equilibrium is the amount of people that want a job equals roughly the amount of people that uh, can uh, – jobs that people – that are available to people. 
So these are the jobs that companies can afford to, uh, to hire, people they can hire. This is the amount of people that want it, right? So you kind of want it to be around here because what's my employment going to be if it's around there? Is my unemployment going to be super high or super low? It'll be low, right? Most people that want jobs have them here, okay? So what a uh, price floor is, is that's a minimum wage. So let's pretend that uh, California said, no, 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 this price isn't good enough. We want to make sure businesses are paying you at least $14 an hour, all right? So what would happen uh, to the, uh, the price? So it's at 13, right? That's where it's at right now. What would happen to the price if California said, nope, it's got to be 14, that's the law. Where would that line move? So it's at 13 now, where would it go? It would go up. <coughs> that's where it would be. Okay. What, what just occurred? Now you got a surplus. A surplus of what? Not jobs. You filled me up more. Yeah. You have a surplus now. You guys know this, what it looks like on a Surplus of workers. Yeah, surplus of workers. Available workers, people that want jobs. Translation for that, by the way, is unemployment. So here's what happens. Um, when they require companies to pay you more, they either have to do one, one of two things, and they usually do both things, by the way. They usually have to raise the price to pay for your additional wages, right? So that's gonna contribute to inflation, right? Because they gotta raise prices. Cost production went up. And that usually means they can't hire as many people because you're now more expensive. So one of two things happens there. Either if you're like working at McDonald's, for example, you might not get fired, but instead of getting 20 hours a week, now they cut you down to eight hours a week or 10 or whatever it is. So either your hours get cut or you lose your job entirely, they have to lay you off. All right, so that's why uh, when, when we're looking at the uh, available jobs, companies looking for workers, this is actually gonna decrease in quantity, or whatever the numbers would be here. Let's just say this is 50,000 people, and this is 25,000 people, and this is 75,000 people. Um, at this point, I would have several, uh, tens of thousands of people without a job because they got unemployed or they got their hours cut and they want to uh, work because they need more money, but the, uh, um, in this case, the demand for labor, the uh, uh, producers, they can't provide that many jobs. So uh, they can only provide this many, whatever it would be, about 25,000 or 30,000, uh, and then there's this many people that want work, which would be like, I don't know, 60,000 or so. As a result, uh, by increasing that price to 14, uh, they just laid off and made unemployment uh, go up by like 20 or 30,000 people. All right, that's how it works. The market will over time adjust, but this creates a situation where you have uh, unemployment. So over time, when we use minimum wage and things like that, uh, what we get actually, unfortunately, is inflation, because they gotta increase the price because the cost of production went up, uh, and you also have an increase in unemployment. Because a surplus of people looking for workers is just unemployed people that have no money or, or not enough money. All right, so does that, does that make sense? You guys kinda got that? The way that we use them now more effectively is uh, when people put, or the government puts a, uh, uh, a price for below equilibrium, right? So if you're, uh, that's equilibrium, right? That's what the current market is. If I put the price floor below it, does it do anything? If, it, if let's say every company is paying at least $13 an hour and the government says, no, you, uh, we're, we're gonna say you can't pay any less than $12. Does that do anything? Why does it not do anything? Because they're already... Um, You're on it, they're already what? They're already paying 13. Yes, they're already paying more than that. So put, making a price for below uh, equilibrium doesn't do anything. For it to actually be effective and do something, you have to put it above equilibrium because that brings the prices up. So what they de generally do now is they'll, they'll put a price floor just below equilibrium. So it doesn't affect the market, but if something were to happen and they try to just gouge you guys uh, or, or anybody of wages, they can't do that. All right, so let's say that every company got together and like, okay, let's just screw these guys over and just pay them $8 instead. If I, got a, if I have a price floor just below equilibrium, they can't. The, the lowest they could go down is that 12. Uh, so it kind of protects you in that way. But just know this, because I think this is one of the questions on the exam, is for a price floor to actually be effective and do anything, it has to be above equilibrium. Otherwise, nothing changes because the, the price is already higher, so it doesn't really matter. So, do we understand what a price floor is and how it actually causes, in many cases, inflation and employment, if you put it above equilibrium? Okay, cool. It's kind of the reverse for 
rent, or, or sorry, a, a price ceiling. So we use the rent as an example. All right, if I'm talking uh, rent, I'm going to change these numbers because rent's not $13. So it's uh, uh, per month, per month, it'd be like, uh, let's use easy numbers. Let's go with 500, six, I mean, there's no rent out though, come on. Let's do, uh, we'll just do 2,000, use California standard, 2,500, 3,000, 1,500, 1,000, 500. Okay, and there's the people that would, would want it. All right, we'll move these numbers so they wind up easier. All right, if I'm looking at a uh, uh, rent here, right, this is the price of rent per month, and that's the amount of people that are willing to, uh, the quantity. Um, what would my uh, supply and demand graphs be? This one's actually easier. It's just like we've done before. So who wants to rent things? What do we call people that want to rent? Huh, homeless people? Yeah. Well, uh, we, we could call them uh, uh, prospective tenants. We'll just put tenants. Uh, prospective means they, they're looking to. Uh, uh, yeah. we'll, we'll be nicer than that. Uh, it doesn't mean that they're homeless. They could, they could be living somewhere else. They just want to move there. Uh, but yeah, prospective tenants. Prospective tenants. All right. So that's the people that would want uh, an actual uh, apartment or home or whatever. Uh, and who's supplying it? The landlords. Right. Could be a company. Could be an individual. Could be anything. All right. That's the company or individual that owns the property that is allowing you to live there with a contract where you pay them every month. All right. Okay, so let's pretend equilibrium in California right now is at 2,000. So that's where we're at. Okay, so roughly the same amount of people that are uh, wanting a place is roughly the same amount as the people that are uh, uh, putting a place out for rent. Okay, so that's all right. Um, if I was to put a price ceiling that actually did something, would I put it above or below equilibrium? Let's say I do put it above. All right, let's say it's 2,000 right now and the government says, nope, California, the max you can charge is 3,000. Is that gonna do anything? Why not? It's the max. The max is already... Yeah, it's not, even, it's not even at the max, it's below the max still, so it won't do anything. Maybe in two or three years if they raise prices constantly and it gets there, it will. But right now, if it's 2,000 equilibrium and I say the max is 3,000, it doesn't do anything at the moment. So where do I have to put a price ceiling for it to actually be effective and do something below yeah because that would actually force the prices lower all right so let's say they do that california says nope that's too much we're going to require uh a, a maximum rent uh, cost for whatever bedroom home uh at 1500 dollars. what's going to occur more people want to buy rent so. okay so the demand for people to want to rent super high we're at 75k here but how many are actually available because it's now uh, uh, not as a, now they have to charge lower prices. What? Yeah, yeah, 225,000, right? So what is the situation called that I have here? Shortage. You got a shortage, right. So when you put price ceilings uh, on goods and they're effective, usually what happens is it causes a, it creates a shortage. All right, uh, and that's obviously no good for anybody. Uh, you've got very unhappy um, landlords who can't profit or, or provide enough um, uh, homes and, and make money themselves. But then you also have more people that are able to buy it, uh, at least the price, but then there's no actual home for them uh, to go out and purchase. This happens frequently, by the way. It happened in New York a couple times where they capped rent and all it ended up being was just more homeless people uh, because there was a, a massive shortage in um, uh, rentals available. They did this even worse twice I don't know how you do this twice, but um, during the French Revolution, super long time ago, they had a famine. Uh, there wasn't enough food to go around. There wasn't enough grain uh, for bread for people. This is one of the causes of the French Revolution, actually. Uh, so if I have only a little bit of bread and everybody wants it, what's going to happen to the price of that bread? It's going to go up, right? So this is so down. Uh, the government at the time is like, you know what? These prices are too much for people to afford. We want to fix the famine. So what we're going to do is we're going to put a price ceiling. All right, and uh, I'm gonna make up the costs here. Let's say bread was, let's say bread was, I don't know, $3 a loaf, four, five, two, and one, and that wouldn't be zero. So now that's 50 cents, and that looks weird. Um, let's say it was here, right, in the French Revolution, it'd actually even be lower than that. It's probably more like, there was already a shortage, so it was right here, let's say. 
price. There's already people that can't afford it. And the French government comes and says, no, uh, you must charge $2 a, a loaf instead of $2.50 a loaf. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, what would happen if they forced it even lower? Let's do it. They set, a, they set it at $2. They force people to charge less for their bread and their grain. This is what happened, by the way. Uh, what actually happens to famine? Get better or worse? Worse. It gets worse, right, because people are less willing and able to provide it, right? Maybe it's not profitable anymore, or they could just make something else and make more money off of it. Uh, but then more people could afford it, so more people want it. So it actually made the famine worse. So the uh, price ceiling uh, equaled a worse famine in their case. Uh, Germany tried this after World War I as well. Uh, and every time you try things like this, it just worsens things that are already uh, in short supply. <clears throat> so it's not as easy to... Uh, fix problems by just having the government cap prices uh, because then people can't provide the service. So what we have here with, uh, in the case of price controls is uh, price floor results in almost every time some form of inflation because cost production goes up, so like minimum wage, uh, and unemployment because they can no longer provide that anymore, uh, and price ceilings uh, often result in um, uh, a shortage. So again, usually what governments do now is they put them out of what's called effective range. So for a price ceiling, like the rent, they would put it above equilibrium. So it doesn't do anything, but it, cause, it prevents a, a company or, or, or landlord from just gouging you and charging three times as much randomly uh, out of nowhere. Uh, and same with price floors. Uh, they'll put minimum wage below equilibrium, uh, so it doesn't do anything to the market at the time, but that way employers can't just you know, decide to work together and charge you way less money. Uh, or, for your, or pay you way less money for your wages, all right? But in the past, uh, these things had been implemented, so what had happened across a few decades from the 1930s uh, to the 1950s, at least, when unions started losing their uh, uh, impact after the Taft-Hartley Act, uh, we had some inflation occurring. So we understand that. All right, you will have to know uh, how to look at a price floor and price ceiling on a graph and then know where they actually have to go to do anything. All right, so yeah, this one might confuse the hell out of you. So I'll do my best to explain this one. The gold standard is a hard one to comprehend. So one, another measure that contributed to inflation a lot was in 1971, in an effort to try to uh, pave off some debts from the Vietnam War and various other programs that are, were increasingly expensive to the federal government, uh, Richard Nixon, 71 plus Nixon. He uh, decided to, uh, and by the way, it actually turns out to have worked out for us in the long run, but in the short term, it looked like a disaster. Uh, he got rid of the gold standard, or at least the, the treasury's exchanging of, of gold for, for currency. So what the gold standard did, and this is, this is where I lose most people, the gold standard basically protects the American dollar or, or any country that uses it, protects their currency, in this case the American dollar, from uh, experiencing wild inflation. There's a thing called hyperinflation, by the way. I don't know if you guys ever heard of it. If you've had me in history, I at least talked about it. Um, if you forgot, between World War I and World War II in the 1920s, um, when, um, obviously that's not including the 30s, but in the 1920s in, in Germany, they had a lot of debt to pay off. Um, in, uh, from, from World War I to pay reparations. So they're like, well, we don't have enough money to pay this stuff off. Um, so they came up with the brilliant idea of just printing a bunch of money to pay off the debt. So what do you think happens if you decide to just print a bunch of, mo bunch of money uh, to pay off this debt uh, that you owe to other countries? Inflation goes up. Yeah, but we actually experienced a phenomenon called hyperinflation where they print so much money to pay this debt off that the value of the, in this case, the mark, goes down so much that you have to pay ridiculous amounts uh, of marks to buy even simple things. I think I gave the example yesterday, didn't I, about the, uh, the loaves of bread thing? Yeah, yeah like, it, it required people to bring like a cart full of cash just to go to the grocery store uh, to buy a couple essential items. It was so bad that um, it became more cost efficient to take your money because back then they didn't have like air conditioners and central heating, they just you know basically had a furnace or a fireplace to generally keep their house warm. Um, it was actually more cost efficient to burn the money than it was to like buy firewood or coal or things like that. 
Uh, so you had, uh, there's pictures too of a, a little lady just shoveling uh, marks into her furnace to burn for heat. Uh, there's pictures of like the roads with the gutters just full of uh, money because it was so worthless. It wasn't even worth like a penny. You wouldn't even go want to pick it up because it's just, I mean, it's just not worth anything. Um, that's hyperinflation. That's the danger. The reason why the gold standard was put in place initially just to try to prevent that. And here's how it kind of does that. The uh, U.S. Treasury or whatever uh, monetary authority that they have, um, what they do is they uh, fix, make permanent, or at least as long as they say it, they fix the uh, currency value with gold. Value with gold. So here's how they do it. The U.S. government or treasury or whoever's got it, whatever state you're looking at, they have a certain amount of gold, and they say one dollar equals um, whatever amount of gold, ounces of gold. And they, they state that that's the actual cost. And what they do is if you want to trade in your money for gold, you can at whatever price they set. So I'm going to make it up. I think it was, this might be the wrong price, but I think in 1970 it was 35, 35 US dollars per ounce of gold. I might be off on that, but even if I am, we're just, we're just going to use this as the standard. Uh, and they did this for years. So we knew exactly what the US dollar was worth because that's what the government traded it for. And if they wanted to ever uh, devalue their currency and make it worth less uh, because there's more money floating around, they would just up this to $50 uh, per ounce of gold. All right, that would make it uh, worth less. How could they make the dollar worth more, the treasury, if they wanted to? What would they do with the price? This is gonna decrease the value. There's less stuff you can buy for a dollar. If they wanted to, make their dollar worth more, what could they do? Yeah, exactly, they go the opposite direction. If they wanted to make their dollar worth, or dollar worth more, they would just maybe up to 25, or down it rather, to 25 per ounce of gold. So that's how they would do it. They would sort of control it that way uh, and you get this sort of fixed amount. So it didn't really matter how much money was out there. The US government fixed the, the value at, you know, with gold at 35 per ounce. And depending on what they wanted to do, they could uh, increase or decrease that exchange rate, all right? So that does kind of stabilize a currency value, which, which can be good, right? It can prevent hyperinflation and things like that. But Nixon, because he wanted to uh, uh, use currency more fluently with the market to try to pay off these war debts, he got rid of it. So what do you think happened to the value of the American dollar very, very, very quickly? What? Yeah, it lost its value. It was able to just fluctuate with the market. So instead of the US Treasury Department saying, this is what it's worth, it was all dependent um, I should say value was dependent. Value was dependent on um, uh, the market. So basically, how much money was out there would determine the prices. So that, that's the example I gave you guys earlier. Like if I gave you all $10 per month and said, you're gonna go in and out or not? The answer is almost certainly no, because that would waste all of your money in one shot in a month. So you wouldn't buy anything. So in and out would have to like lower its prices. Uh, but if I gave you all $1,000, uh, by printing much money or whatever, uh, you would all go in and out and you would spend it and then probably in and out or whatever you're buying stuff from would raise their prices because you guys are buying so frequently. So if you don't set a cap on the, uh, with a gold standard, you do allow uh, your currency value to go up or down depending on what the market does. In this case, there was a whole bunch of US dollars out there. So very, very, very quickly, uh, the value of the uh, US dollar dropped by a lot Uh, and this, when the dollar loses its value, that all that means is it increased inflation. So now you had prices go up very, very quickly because there was so much money floating around and there was no government uh, institution saying this is what the dollars were. It was just whatever you decided you were willing to pay for it, which caused the, of course, prices of everything to go up very, very, very quickly. Um, I have a graph here I'll show you, but obviously the internet won't see it. It basically says this, US inflation um, for, uh, uh, for like from 1900 to now, so like it was 1900, this is 1950, and this is 2000. Obviously we're over here, but um, the amount of percentage of inflation, if this is like 1,000%, which is a tenth of the value, 2,000%, which is a 20th of the value. Um, inflation kind of went like this for the US. It was barely moving. It was up or just a little bit. And you'll see when I show you, it's basically a hockey stick graph. And then when 1971 hits, Right when they get rid of this gold standard, what do you think happens to inflation? Yeah. And it goes way, way, way up. So the US dollar um, now compared to pre-1971 is worth way less than it was. 
Uh, it actually turns out that this worked out in the long run because there was so much money floating around and the world globalized. Um, and that allowed inflation to not really matter as much because there was a lot of money to float out around the world. It actually turned out to be kind of a success, but in the, uh, in the short term, in like, you know, 1972, 73, uh, 74, it sucked for people. Why would it suck for people in those few years when it spikes really, really early and no one's ready for it? All your hard money just like, All your hard money just lost value, yeah. So let's pretend um, uh, since it's 1971 dollars, Let's say in my bank account, I've been saving up and I've, I've got a house and all this and uh, we've done really well and I've got $50,000 in the bank. And that's, the, that's like a lot of money in 1970 or 1971, right? That could buy me, uh, that could possibly buy me a house. I could buy a house cash maybe if I saved up super well like that, all right? But what if I have a spike of inflation that goes up uh, 500%? You can probably buy like a used yeah, it's going to go down quite a bit. So uh, by 1974, once the dollar's value has uh, uh, decreased uh, to, a, to a fifth or there's 5% inflation, now uh, a house might be worth, I mean, I'm making an extreme example, but that same amount of money wouldn't buy you a house. Uh, now that house, same house, would cost $250,000 in a 1974. It wasn't this extreme, guys, but I'm just making the point. Uh, why would that suck for you if your bank account had $50,000 in 1971? They're not nearly as rich as I was before, right? And this is what it upset a lot of people. Uh, and it caused a lot of businesses to uh, have to lay people off. And it, it, it just it really had a negative impact on the economy. So people that were just saving money well, which had been okay, right? Because relative to the, the value of currency had been relatively stable. Uh, when this occurred and it spiked, it didn't spike this much. But when it did spike, uh, people were kind of panicked because the money they had that was worth something in 1970 and 71 was, was worth much, much muscle, much less. And it's not like they drastically earned more, uh, so it was a problem for people. All right. Obviously, you're not going to have no money gained for, for four years, so they probably saved up to like you know, 70000 or 80000 at that point. But look, the amount that it's going to buy them is way, way less, so they actually lose value. This is why, by the way, it's generally not a good idea if you do have savings, just have it sit in the bank. Uh, because if it, when inflation occurs, and it roughly happens at like two, three, four percent a year, uh, you're actually just losing value every single year. The reason why you would not want to just stick it in a bank is because uh, you will, if it just sits there, your money just, you're essentially just losing money as far as money value goes over time. That's why most people choose to invest their money, which can be risky, because you know you can invest in a stock and the stock plummets, but usually stocks or real estate or uh, uh, investing in a business or, or, or raw materials like oil, things like that, usually those go up with the prices. So like for example, if he did buy a house in 1970 and it was $50,000, he'd be okay, because uh, he could just sell that house for $250,000 and, and get that money back at the same value. Uh, so that's why if you ever have a large sum of money, I, I would suggest uh, use your own discretion, but probably don't just let it sit in the bank because this is probably going to occur to you over time. In fact, it will occur to you over time. So put it in something that will, its value will go up with the, uh, with the inflation in the market. Anyways, that included uh, drastically uh, spiked inflation. We've adjusted to it now, but uh, in 1971, 73, and 4, it was pretty bad for people. You guys got that? All right.